Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. When we picture, or at least when most of us picture pirates in our mind, we typically picture young Anglo-Saxon men from Great Britain or Ireland. Now this is of course not accurate, but it's due to a few societal factors. First, most of our image of pirates is derived from Captain Charles Johnson and his general history of pirates, and Captain Johnson was writing for an English audience about English pirates. Second, though, it is kind of grounded in reality. It was in the years following the War of Spanish Succession that there were hundreds or maybe even thousands of young English privateers stranded in the Caribbean. This led to that great explosion of piracy that almost brought Europe's most powerful empires to its knees. Now, ever since the end of the Anglo-Spanish War that was waged between Queen Elizabeth of England and King Philip of Spain, we've largely ignored European politics. But to understand exactly how all of those young English privateers came to be in the Caribbean in the first place, we're going to need a greater understanding of what was happening on the continent, and occasionally we're going to need to turn our eyes away from the New World and back to Europe. Now, we did talk... Briefly, about the English Civil War, that's true, but what was happening on the continent in the mid-17th century was really one of the most important periods in European history. It ranks up there with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, or the Napoleonic Era, or the First and Second World Wars. Today, I want to try to give an overview of what was happening in Europe during those years. Now, in some ways, really in a lot of ways, this is a foolish endeavor. The sheer scale of this story is daunting. We're talking about decades of history with dozens of wars and seemingly endless factions and rivalries, all sorts of shifting alliances. We're talking about the rise and fall of great dynasties like the Stuarts and the Habsburgs and the Bourbons. We're talking about the establishment of nation-states that, though they would be contested, many of them are still in existence today. I also want to note that this is a subject that's a little bit out of my expertise and out of my comfort zone, but I think it's an important story to tell in the greater context of what we're talking about on the show. Luckily, though, we can narrow this subject down and be a little bit more focused. We can look, more specifically, at the events as they relate to England and Spain, France and the Netherlands, and how those events impacted the men and women on the ground. Events that would change the face of not only Europe, but the New World, and lay the foundation for the Golden Age of Piracy. This is episode number 24, Pit Stop on the Continent, Part 1. Now, as many of you may know, I have trouble figuring out exactly where to start telling a story. There are a lot of obvious places to start this story, but I think that I want to go all the way back to the year 1555. That was the year that the Treaty of Augsburg was signed by the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Remember him? He was the emperor when Martin Luther and Lutheranism rose to prominence. The Treaty of Augsburg was an attempt to end all of that religious turmoil that was tearing Central Europe apart. Like all good compromises, though, it left both parties feeling a little bit cheated and a little bit angry. It was far from perfect. You couldn't call it universal religious freedom, but it did end hostilities for a time. It established a certain sense of religious pluralism in the Holy Roman Empire, and it allowed for most of the local lords in the Holy Roman Empire to practice the religion of their choice. Now, while it did end hostilities, it didn't alleviate the tensions between the Lutherans and the Catholics. I'd like you to think about your hometown, and then I'd like you to think about the next town over. There was probably a little bit of friendly competition between the two towns, right? The high school football teams have an ages-old rivalry. Your grandpa probably has stories about stealing their mascot and then having his stolen in return. Anyone from your town that went out on a date with somebody from that next town over was probably just a little bit ostracized, right? You have the better movie theater, but they got the shopping mall. It's Springfield and Shelbyville, that sort of thing. Now, I'd like you to imagine that the next town over is, in fact, ruled by an iron-fisted dictatorial zealot 
The people in that town are all religious maniacs that provane and pervert all of your customs and belief. Not only that, those people actively want to make you give up your one true faith and adhere to their heresy. They want you and all of your children to reject the true gospel and burn an eternal hellfire. With the Treaty of Osberg allowing local lords to practice the faith of their choice, this was the situation in Germany for decades. As you can imagine, it, it didn't always go smoothly. But for the most part, the Treaty of Osberg held, and for good reason. All one had to do was to look at the other kingdoms in Europe and see how warring over religion was treating them. In England, they were dealing with severe religious persecution from both sides, and the German nobles wanted to avoid as much of that as possible. Even after Elizabeth took the throne and tried to bring the two sides together, well, that was the first Protestant monarch on a major European throne, and that set a dangerous precedent to the Catholic power structure. Over in France, the Calvinist Huguenot forces were causing all sorts of trouble for their ruling class, and even in the Netherlands, there was an ongoing war between the Spanish occupying forces and their Protestant enemies. Now, as far as the Catholics in Europe were concerned, the situation wasn't that dire. France's royal house of Valois was a properly Catholic house. They'd never have a Protestant set on the throne. The Spanish monarch, who was Charles V's son and a Habsburg cousin to the Holy Roman Emperor, Philip II, had England and the Netherlands well in hand. Queen Elizabeth was likely to either marry a Catholic, probably Philip II, or be dethroned, and the Dutch rebels themselves were even faltering. But then, in 1572, everything began to fall apart all across Europe. In France, Henry of Navarre married Margaret of Valois, putting him in line to potentially become the king of France. Catherine de' Medici failed to catch him in her web during the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and a Protestant was now in line to sit on the throne of France. In England, Elizabeth had refused to marry Philip II and survived the Rodolphi plot on her life. Now, she went on to expel the sea beggars from the English ports, which sounded nominally like a Catholic victory until these shockingly well-funded and well-supplied rapscallions took the city of Denbrill and the Dutch Revolt was once again in full swing. You might recall we talked about all this in a previous episode or two, but we're playing a little bit of catch-up here. By the 1580s or so, the situation had grown close to desperate for the Catholics in France. Sir Francis Drake had finally returned from his circumnavigation in 1580, and tensions with Spain were at their worst. The States General, there in the Netherlands, offered the role of king of their nation to Francois, the Duke of Anjou, in 1581. Now, he took the throne, but he failed to hold it, so the Dutch offered the crown to Queen Elizabeth of England, but she declined, and the Dutch found themselves without a monarch, so they chose to do the unthinkable at that time in Europe, and discarded monarchy altogether in favor of a republic. This proved to be a perfect time for them to do so because Spain had bigger problems elsewhere. In 1584, the Spanish signed the Treaty of Joinville, which made Spain officially declare war on England. And even then, King Philip II of Spain had even bigger problems in France. In 1583, Henry of Navarre had abandoned any pretense at Catholicism at all. He had escaped the royal palace to join his Calvinist Huguenot rebel allies. When the king of France's brother died, Henry of Navarre became the presumptive heir to the throne of France. There were, of course, some other potential monarchs, but many of them had uncomfortably close ties to the Habsburg dynasty, and France had long fought to keep as much Habsburg influence out of their politics as possible. There were women who were properly Catholic and had no ties to the Habsburg line, but if the French declared a woman from the female line to take the throne, it would actually delegitimize generations of French monarchs and change the entire dynasty in France. So, with no clear answer, France was thrown into a war. It was a war called the War of the Three Henrys. It was between Henry of Navarre, who we've been talking about, and the current monarch on the throne, Henry III, and then there was a third Henry, a man named Henry the Duke of Guise, who was a powerful noble and a fierce Catholic. Now, the Duke of Guise had powerful support from basically all of the Catholic elements in France. He had the French clergy, he had Philip II of Spain, and he even had the Pope on his side. 
All of these forces coalesced into what was called the Catholic League in France. The League's plan was to expel or execute every Protestant in France and exile any French nobleman who was even sympathetic to the Huguenot cause. Now, Henry of Navarre, who was a Protestant, a Calvinist, allied with King Henry III, who was a Catholic, to see that the Duke of Guise never took the throne and France stayed free from any Habsburg influence. So England was in the hands of a Protestant, France was in the midst of a civil war, and the Netherlands had altogether done away with monarchy and now had a Protestant republic. It's easy to see why the Catholic forces in Europe would form a Catholic League. Now, the Holy Roman Empire almost certainly had a hand in the Catholic League as well, or at least parts of the empire did. You see, the Holy Roman Empire wasn't really a nation. It was basically a confederation of essentially autonomous city-states, baronies, dukedoms, principalities, and kingdoms. Now, they all fell under the nominal rule of the Holy Roman Emperor, and the level of control in the empire largely differed based on who was in power. But by the 1580s, the emperor was not a strong ruler. His name was Rudolf II, and he was the king of Germany, Bohemia, Hungary, and Croatia, and he was a fascinating character. He was probably bisexual. He was known to take many, many lovers and rumored to be of both genders. He was obsessed with the occult and the sciences at the same time, and he was endlessly fascinated with Roman mythology. He had, at one point himself, painted in the likeness of Vertumnus, the Roman god of the seasons. He named his illegitimate son Don Julius Caesar de Austria. Don Julius Caesar was probably schizophrenic, and later in life would go on to murder and mutilate a local woman. So Rudolf II likely suffered from at least similar ailments. The Habsburg line in particular is notorious for showing signs of mental illness that probably stems from their extensive inbreeding. Rudolf certainly suffered from at least severe depression, what he in his life called melancholy, and eventually he withdrew entirely from public life but not before being elected Holy Roman Emperor. That's right, he was elected Holy Roman Emperor. That's how these emperors, at the time at least, were chosen. Now, they weren't exactly democratically elected. The people didn't have a vote. Instead, there was a group of chosen nobility within the empire that were given electoral power to choose their emperor. Now, for the most part, these nobles were Catholic, and they were loyal to the Habsburg line, so the empire had been securely in the hand of the House of Habsburg for generations. But then, in 1583, all of that began to change. The Prince Archbishop of Cologne, Gebhard Trutches von Waldberg, converted from Catholicism to Calvinism. Now, this was a problem for the Catholic majority, as Gebhard was an imperial elector and could possibly shift the balance of power to the Protestants. Not only was a French Protestant about to be crowned, but it was a very real possibility that the next Holy Roman Emperor could be Protestant as well. Now, once again, the Treaty of Augsburg had a backup plan for this. If he converted, which he did, under the treaty, Prince Gebhard was required to step down. But then he didn't. He elected to keep his position and his electoral status, despite converting to Protestantism. So several other prince bishops in the region gathered an army and began what was called the Cologne War to take back the city and install a Catholic ruler there. By 1588, Lord Gebhard was out and a proper Catholic ruler was put into his place. What's significant here, though, is that essentially foreign leaders were interfering in the dynastic line of Cologne. Now, they were all subjects of the empire and operated under the Treaty of Augsburg, officially, but the use of force by Gebhard's peers and not the emperor himself set a truly dangerous precedent in the Holy Roman Empire. Regardless, though, for a time the Treaty of Augsburg held and the threat of a Protestant emperor was averted. The empire was mostly peaceful again. That same year, 1588, the Spanish Armada attempted that famous invasion of England, only to be repelled, and the Anglo-Spanish War was now underway. Back in France, the War of the Three Henrys was still underway, but then Henry III had Henry, Duke of Guise, murdered. Now, this ended the Duke's claim to the throne, naturally, but the Catholic League still held the city of Paris, and... King Philip II of Spain, in particular, pushed for a Catholic monarch of 
the Habsburg line, to become the duke's successor. Now, in 1589, the next year, King Henry III died, but not before officially naming Henry of Navarre as his heir. Now, nominally, he became King Henry IV, who was a Protestant king of France, but he still had to take control of Paris before he could be crowned and recognized by the whole of France. Two Henrys were dead now, but the War of the Three Henrys still raged on. Now, as part of the Anglo-Spanish War, really, Queen Elizabeth sent English forces both to the Netherlands and to France. In France, they were sent to aid the new Protestant king, Henry IV, and to counter any Spanish Habsburg influence there. They were largely ineffective in the war, though, and the war with the Catholic League sort of drew to a stalemate. So, in 1593, Henry IV made what was truly a drastic move. He elected to convert to Catholicism. Elizabeth, as well as all his Huguenist allied nobility, and even his Calvinist forces themselves, were shocked and enraged. Henry himself said of their consternation, quote, Paris is well worth a mass, end quote. Now, this move gained him the support of much of Catholic France. They now had a native French king who was free of Habsburg influence to rally behind, and who was a good solid Catholic. So he was crowned in 1594, and that was the beginning of what would be called the House of Bourbon. Now, by August of 1598, Queen Elizabeth's top advisor and most trusted counselor, William Cecil, passed away. He was, at the time, probably the most powerful man in England, and Elizabeth felt his loss not only personally, but in the void he left in her reign as the war with Spain continued. In September, though... Philip II of Spain died as well. The war continued after his death, but Spain's funds and their morale were suffering. Then, just a few years later, in 1603, Queen Elizabeth died as well. The Anglo-Spanish War was finally at an end, and as James I took the throne, England kind of took a step back from international relations, for a while at least. They began to have their own internal problems to focus on. Now, we did a whole show about the religious turmoil between the Anglicans and the Puritans that led to the English Civil War, so I won't cover it here. If you haven't heard it, I recommend you go listen to it, and keep it in mind while we cover the rest of Europe. Now, by 1609, the Dutch and the Spanish had entered a ceasefire. This had a lot to do with the coffers of Spain being so light. One of the primary reasons that their coffers were so light was because of the rampant piracy against the Spanish Empire. The English were still in full effect in their piratical war against the Spanish, and the Dutch had even joined in in full force there in the Caribbean and in the North Sea. So with Spain finally calming down, Europe for a time was almost peaceful. Philip's successor, Philip III, ruled the Spanish Empire. James I was attended by Shakespeare and his players, and the Dutch enjoyed, well, the flowering of their republic. Henry IV of France was assassinated in 1610, but he was peacefully succeeded by his young son, Louis XIII, and his mother was kind of acting as a regent. Most of Europe, for a time at least, had had enough of war. They needed uh, time to recover. Now, in the Holy Roman Empire, Rudolf II was succeeded by his brother Matthias. I guess illegitimate schizophrenic murderers aren't fit to be emperor, even if they are named Julius Caesar. Now, unlike the rest of Europe, the Holy Roman Empire wasn't peaceful. In fact, they were about to explode. Perhaps it's because, while most of Europe had been busy fighting themselves silly, the Holy Roman Empire had largely avoided that. It was in 1607 that a free city within the borders of Bavaria called Donauwerth denied the Catholics in their region their right to parade through their Protestant town. The parade was seen as an insult to the locals, but it was a right that the Catholics had under the Treaty of Augsburg, and naturally they took exception to being barred from the town. A brawl, or perhaps a riot, depending on who you asked, uh, ensued that looked very much like a potential rebellion. So the emperor ordered the Duke of Bavaria to subdue the town and to reinstate Catholicism there. This was illegal. Despite being within the borders of Bavaria, Donalworth was not under the duke's rule and shouldn't have been attacked by his forces. Reinstating Catholic dominion flew in the face of the Treaty of Augsburg completely. The Catholic forces in the Holy Roman Empire were 
flexing their muscles and Catholic leadership within the empire then declared that the Treaty of Augsburg would only be renewed and Protestant rights respected at all if the Catholic lands appropriated since 1552 were returned. That is, all lands appropriated by Catholics in the past century or so had to be returned to their Catholic masters. This was an obvious challenge to the very existence of Protestantism in Germany, and they responded as you might expect. A man who was, perhaps, the most powerful Protestant in the empire at the time, a man named Frederick IV, called a council of all of the other Protestant princes. They formed what was to be called the Protestant Union. Now, it was a primarily military alliance between most of the Protestant German princes. Notably, though, there were a very few powerful regions that declined to join, probably seeing their interests in Catholic lands potentially suffering. The Union, though, promised to defend all of its members against any Catholic aggression. It worked kind of like NATO was designed to work. If any ally was invaded, then they had to treat it like the entirety of Protestantism and the Holy Roman Empire was invaded. Now, it may have been even intended to start a rebellion, but their leader Frederick died of alcoholism soon after forming the Union. Not before, however, the Catholic Prince Bishops organized their own Catholic League. This was known as the German Catholic League, as opposed to the French Catholic League from earlier, and it was a separate entity, but it was very much in the same model, as was the Protestant League, really. Now, Frederick's son, after he died, became Frederick V, and was raised to the rank of Elector Palatine. That is, he was the elected lord of a Bohemian state on the Rhine. Now, just to show how intertwined all of Europe is at this point in history, Frederick's mother was the daughter of William of Nassau. Do you remember him from many, many episodes ago? William the Silent, who was in charge of the sea beggars in the Dutch revolt against Spain, the man who was like a son to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, and might possibly have married Queen Elizabeth had things worked out slightly differently? Well, his grandson, Frederick V, would go on to marry Elizabeth Stuart, who was the daughter of King James of England and produce a line of Hanoverian nobility that would eventually go on to supplant the Stuarts on the throne of England, producing a conflict in the British Empire that would see men like Benjamin Hornigold, Edward Teach, abandoned far from home on Caribbean islands and deeply embittered towards their pretender monarch back in England. You see, there are reasons that I'm choosing to talk about all of these names and dates from centuries before the Golden Age of Piracy. All of this eventually ties back into itself. These are conflicts in the highest halls of power that really did affect the lives of everyday people and our story about piracy as a whole. So, back to Frederick and the Holy Roman Empire. Frederick positioned himself at the head of the Protestant League his father had helped build. By the time he reached his majority, that is, the age of 18, and married that Elizabeth Stuart, the Emperor Matthias had finally grown old. Now, Matthias was, in religious terms at least, a conciliatory emperor. He was attempting to strengthen the empire by bridging the divide between Catholic and Protestant, but... The man most likely to replace him as emperor was anything but. Ferdinand was not fond of Protestants. He was a Habsburg, and therefore naturally a Catholic. His religious policy was one of de-reformation. He wanted to see Protestant heretical influence purged from every court in Europe. Now, in 1617, he was elected heir, or what you might call king-elect of Bohemia, He was the chosen successor of the Emperor Matthias, and the Bohemian crown was his first step in that. He chose two administrators to oversee Bohemian affairs, as Bohemia was merely one of many districts that he was to be the ruler of. When these two administrators arrived in Bohemia in May 1618, they were greeted by a force of Protestants. The Protestants had learned of the new King Ferdinand's plans to see them all illegally disenfranchised and stripped of all power, and they confronted his two administrators. And then, well, they threw them from a window. Somehow, the administrators survived. Depending on whose story you believe, they were either saved by angels and the Virgin Mary herself, or 
they landed in a pile of manure. Personally, I think, well, when you look at the window today, you realize it's just not all that high. Now, this event, called the Second Defenstration of Prague, was the first act of what would be called the Thirty Years' War. Now, Bohemia wasn't a part of the Protestant Union, but after this act, the Second Defenstration of Prague, they cut a deal with Frederick to be admitted into the Union. They said, let us join, send us military aid, and we'll make you the next king of Bohemia. This was a pretty big deal. You see, the emperor... The Holy Roman Emperor was already king of Bohemia, and the king-elect was his heir. If Frederick took the crown of Bohemia, it would be an open act of war against the empire itself. But when Matthias died and his heir became Emperor Ferdinand II, Frederick made his move. He marched an army all the way to Prague and ordered another to assist a besieged Protestant stronghold in other areas of Bohemia, and was raised the king. This was, admittedly, probably the best time for him to take the throne, as the Emperor Ferdinand II was new and relatively weak. The Protestant element there in the Holy Roman Empire really detested the new emperor, even if they weren't officially members of the Union. So Frederick pulled a lot of allies to his side, not just German princes, but whole nations. Denmark and Sweden formally recognized him as a king, as did, ominously, the Dutch Republic. That's ominous because all of this happened in 1619, and in the year 1621, that truce between the Dutch Republic and the Spanish Empire was set to expire. So with many of the Protestant forces in Europe beginning to coalesce and marshal, it's no surprise that when the new emperor called upon his Habsburg cousin, Philip III, to send him aid, the might of Spain began to mobilize. Now, it wasn't just to lend a hand to his ally or even to crush a Protestant uprising. If these Spanish forces took out Frederick, they would secure his homeland along the Rhine. The Rhine would be an invaluable tool in their impending war with the Dutch. After his death, Frederick would be called the Winter King because his reign was so short. In less than a year, Emperor Ferdinand had allied with Philip III of Spain, with Maximilian, the Duke of Bavaria, among many, many other powerful nobles. Maximilian was the leader of the Catholic League within the Holy Roman Empire, and he was promised the King of Bohemia once Frederick was defeated. Frederick, on the other hand, was less rich in his allies. His father-in-law, King James I of England, declined to aid him. The Dutch, with whom he had some close familial ties, were restrained by treaty. They were still technically at peace with Spain, and were they to enter this war now, they would likely invalidate the truce and be vulnerable to Spanish attacks in their homeland. They were also, at the time, engaged in a sort of pseudo-war with Portugal, which was not technically included in the treaty with Spain. Now, we're beginning to catch up with what we covered in the episode The New New World several months ago. This was part of that Portuguese-Dutch war that saw the Dutch invade Brazil in order to gain access to some of the salt mines there. Now, another potential ally for Frederick were the French, who were old, old enemies of the Habsburgs. Unfortunately, Louis XIII, unlike his father Henry, was much more faithfully Catholic and was uncomfortable siding with any Protestant armies against a Catholic emperor. Beyond that, Louis XIII was dealing with conflicts involving his mother and his ranking counselor, Cardinal Richelieu. So with very little support and a ragtag army of 30,000 poorly trained, poorly paid soldiers, the Winter King Frederick marched to meet the entire imperial forces at a place called White Mountain near Prague in 1620. This is one of those battles you find in history that doesn't exactly match its import. When you look at a battle like Waterloo or Stalingrad, these are immense conflicts that change the fate of the world forever. The battle here at White Mountain, though, though it was extremely important in what was to come... It really wasn't much of a battle at all. The Protestants were thoroughly routed, and Ferdinand was forced to flee into exile in the Dutch Republic. He was, in practical terms, 
really no longer a king, but he would continue to serve as a unifying presence for the Protestant forces in Denmark, Sweden, and the Netherlands. The Bohemian Revolt, as it was called, the first act of the Thirty Years' War, was over, and the kingdom was firmly Catholic. But the Thirty Years' War had only just begun. Now these opening moves in this conflict remind me in a lot of ways of the opening moves of World War I. Now, a lot of these dates and names really aren't all that important, but what is important is what they did in the years to come, how they influenced the world that would come out of it. But this Bohemian Revolt was really no more than just a small regional conflict. And if that had ended these hostilities, then the war would be just another series of small revolts in European history that didn't amount to much, just a footnote in a history book. But the thing is, the Spanish were involved, and the treaty with the Netherlands was about to expire, and the Danish and Swedish were only just getting involved. The English were realizing that this was going to become a general European war. This was a conflict that would mirror not only World War I, but the Napoleonic Wars right about in the middle of these two conflicts. Beyond that, This was a conflict that would change the face of Europe and would be fought not only on the European continent, but all across the New World, that would see itself played out in wars in North America, in South America, and perhaps notably to history and to our story, in the Caribbean, amongst pirates. Next time we're going to look at the next few steps of the Thirty Years' War and how it ties in to the French Dutch, Spanish, and English involved in the war, and it's going to march up almost immediately to Captain Morgan and the Buccaneers of Jamaica and Tortuga. I'd like to thank everybody for listening, especially since this was an episode that was a little bit outside of my comfort zone and expertise. I'd also like to thank you for your patience, as well as all of you who have helped support the show, either through donations through the website or becoming patrons on Patreon. Also, anybody out there who has shared us on Facebook, Twitter, or left us a review on iTunes, you guys really help get the podcast noticed, and I appreciate all of you. If you're looking for another way to help support the show and you're interested in getting perhaps a free audiobook, you can check us out at audibletrial.com forward slash pirate history podcast. I've got a book recommendation, what I've been listening to this past month after the theme music. Speaking of the theme music, this week our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you're enjoying their music, why not go on over and check them out at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G.com.au. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com or check us out on Twitter, Facebook, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Most importantly, once again, and as always, thank you for listening.